This is the digital channel of the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. I am Manoj Mainkar and in the next half hour, I'll bring to you news updates from India and around the world, awareness videos on coronavirus by Government of India and a lot more. We'll begin with the news updates. This is the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. Namaskar. The News Snippets. Read by Maria Albina Michael. 456,831 patients have recovered from COVID-19 in the country. In the last 24 hours, 16,883 people have recovered. The recovery rate is 61.53%. The fatality rate is the lowest in the world, says Health Ministry. 262,679 COVID-19 tests were conducted throughout the country in the past 24 hours. West Bengal to reimpose strict lockdown in containment and buffer zones of Kolkata and Howrah from 5 p.m. tomorrow after a spike in the cases. Disengagement at the Indochina borders is continuing. Indian forces are monitoring the process. A civilian was killed and another injured in yet another ceasefire violation by Pakistan at the Balakot sector in Poonch district of Jammu and Kashmir. Bhutan has said that its boundary with China is not demarcated and is under negotiations. Tensions in the Sino-Bhutanese borders have risen recently. India and the U.S. held virtual consultations on the entire gamut of engagements under the Indo-U.S. Comprehensive Global Strategic Partnership. Foreign Secretary Harsvardhan Shringla and U.S. Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs David Hale led their respective delegations. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has tested positive for COVID-19. He, however, said that he is not having any symptoms of coronavirus. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has wished President Bolsonaro a speedy recovery. The Trump administration has notified the U.S. Congress that it is formally withdrawing from the WHO. President Trump accused China of influencing the global health body, despite contributing only $40 million a year. Demonstrators stormed Serbian parliament over coronavirus lockdown. They demanded the resignation of President Aleksandar Vucic. Serbia had announced a strict lockdown as COVID-19 cases have spiked in the country. And that is the end of the news snippets. Every voyage is inspired by a natural human longing of people to see and explore a new world. Travelers in ancient days used to get information about new places from merchant groups. What such visitors recorded later revealed to us details of our ancient history. Much of our knowledge of ancient and medieval Indian history comes from the accounts of foreigners who as pilgrims, travelers and traders cross the seas and difficult land routes to reach India. In their writings on their observations and experiences of a country new and strange to them, they left valuable contributions to the historical understanding of early Indian society. In our program Travelogue, we bring to you some of the foreign travelers' account of India and their understanding of Indian culture and civilization. Travelogues in time. Travelogues in time. Yi Ching, whose name in English is variously spelt and pronounced as Yi Ching, Yi Ching, and Itzing, was a Chinese Buddhist monk of the Tang dynasty who traveled to India by sea during the latter half of the 7th century and studied at the famous Buddhist University of Nalanda for 11 years. Besides being a great Buddhist scholar and traveler, he was also a famous translator of Indian Buddhist texts into Chinese. Yi Ching's family name was Chang and first name Wanming. 
Unlike the other prestigious Chinese pilgrims, Fa Xian and Xuanzang, not much is known about I Ching's family background and his early life, though there are some extant accounts in his own works, which are Nan Hai Chi Kui Nei Fa Chuan, that is an account of the Dharma sent back from the southern seas. Ta Tang Shi Yu Chiu Fa Kao Sang Chuan, that is, record of eminent monks who travelled to India in search of the Dharma during the Thang, and Sung Kao Sang Chuan, that is, records of eminent monks in the Sung dynasty. As indicated in these records, he was born in the ninth year of the Sun Quan era, that is, 635 of the Common Era, during Tai Sung's reign in Fan Yang, modern Zuo Qian, in Hepe province. The same records indicate that he came from a well-to-do family that had produced public officials for several generations. At the age of seven, I Ching was sent to a Buddhist monastery to the west of Qichou for the purpose of receiving ordination. At this monastery, he extensively studied the various Buddhist sutras and the Vinaya under two prominent Buddhist monks, known as Shan Yu and Hui Shi. These two monks also took great care of him during his novitiate. Unfortunately, during his twelfth year, his favorite teacher Shan Yu died. Thereafter, I Ching decided to lay aside the study of secular texts and began devoting himself solely to the critical study of the sacred Buddhist canon. Now he also began to think about travelling to India on attaining the age of maturity. After receiving full ordination at the age of 21, he did a special study for five years of the Vinaya and its principal commentaries. When Yi Ching was confident that he had mastered the Vinaya, at the suggestion of his teacher Hui Shi, he moved to Chang'an to learn about the Yoga Char school. In the year 664, the great Chinese pilgrim Xuanzang's funeral was held in Chang'an and this incident appears to have made a deep impression on I Ching. Unlike pilgrims before him, he could not take the land route to India across Central Asia and the Himalayas because of political turmoil in Tibet, Afghanistan and the surrounding areas. Instead, he made his way to India by sea, taking a more southerly route. In November 671, I Ching embarked on a Persian ship sailing from South China to the Malay Islands. After having sailed for 20 days at sea, he disembarked at Jaya, the capital of Sri Vijaya, on the vast island of Sumatra. The monasteries on Sri Vijaya at this time were great centers of Buddhist studies. Here he spent about six months acquiring the elementary knowledge of Sanskrit. Travelling further on, he passed through the Strait of Malacca to the northwest tip of Sumatra, where he boarded a ship going to the Nicobar Islands. He recorded visits to the nations of Malayu and Kitte Keda and recorded his impression of the Kunlun people using an ancient Chinese word for Malay people. About them he says, Kunlun people have curly hair, dark bodies, bare feet and wear sorongs. In 673, after 10 days travel across the Bay of Bengal, he reached the naked kingdom southwest of Shu. Finally, in the second month of the year 673, I Ching arrived at the Indian seaport of Tamarlipti, the modern town of Tamluk in West Bengal. Here, I Ching studied Sanskrit for a year in the Buddhist temple of Vahara. In the following year, in the company of his new acquaintance from China, Ta Shangtang, I Ching set out on his pilgrimage to Magad. They followed a group of merchants from Tamarlipti. On the way, they encountered mountains, woods and swamps on the way to Nalanda. Halfway to Nalanda, I Ching fell ill and was unable to walk. Gradually, he was left behind by the group. He was looted by bandits and stripped naked. He heard the natives would catch white skins to offer as a sacrifice to the gods, so he jumped into mud and used leaves to cover his lower body. Walking slowly, he reached Nalanda. 
From here, he paid a visit to Mount Gridharkut of Rajgir, viewed the Buddhist relics of Bodh Gaya, Koshinagar, and Mrigdav at Varanasi, and mounted the Kukuttapad Giri near Gaya. He also visited the Jetwan Monastery at Shravasti and the heavenly stairs said to have been built by God Shakra for the Buddha to use in descending from heaven at Sankasya and journeyed to Sarnath and Kukutpat. Although no definite record as to which other countries and places in India Eching had journeyed to, he gives the total number as more than 30 countries which he travelled across. After venerating the Buddhist sites, Eching returned to the celebrated Nalanda University, where he spent 11 years from 675 to 685. Here he became friends with several other Chinese monks, particularly Xuan Cao, Tao Lin, Wu Xing, and Si Hung. At the university, Eching studied a large number of Buddhist texts relating to Buddhist logic, the Abhidharma Kosh, Vinaya, and the Madhyamik and Yogachar philosophies. He also collected some 500,000 Sanskrit stanzas that he believed would fill 1,000 volumes when translated into Chinese. With the manuscripts he had collected at Nalanda, Iching began his return journey in 685 and took the same sea route by which he had travelled to India. When Iching again arrived at Shri Vijaya in 687, at that time, Palimbang was a centre of Buddhism where foreign scholars gathered. Iching praised the high level of Buddhist scholarship at Shri Vijaya and advised Chinese monks to study there prior to making the journey to Nalanda in India. In the fortified city of Bhog, Buddhist priests number more than 1,000 whose minds are bent on learning and good practice according to Iching. They investigate and study all the subjects that exist, just as in India, the rules and ceremonies are not at all different. If a Chinese priest wishes to go to the West in order to hear and read the original scriptures, he had better stay here one or two years and practice the proper rules. He also wrote that Buddhism was flourishing throughout the islands of Southeast Asia. According to him, Many of the kings and chieftains in the islands of the southern sea admire and believe in Buddhism and their hearts are set on accumulating good actions. While in Shri Vijaya, Iching continued with his work to translate original Sanskrit Buddhist scriptures into Chinese. After two years, in 689, he found he needed more supplies for copying the Sanskrit manuscripts. He went to the port to send a letter to China requesting paper and ink, which were not available in Shri Vijaya at that time. While he was drafting his message, the ship unexpectedly set sail with him on board. On August 10, 689, he reached Guangfu, where he recruited four assistants. He returned with them to Shri Vijaya in December 689, and they remained there until 695, working on the translations. In Shri Vijaya, Iching studied under the distinguished teacher Shakya Kirti and wrote an account of Buddhist practices and a report regarding a group of Chinese monks who had travelled to India in search of Buddhism. Iching sent these reports together with his translations of Buddhist sutras to China with one of his assistants in 692. He also produced a detailed geographic account of his travels through India, through the East Indies Islands and also the Malay Peninsula. This written account is a rare account of the early history, culture and religions of the people of Indonesia. In the midsummer of 695, he reached Lo Yang where he was given a grand reception by Empress Wu. His journey had taken amazingly 25 years in all. He brought with him about 400 Buddhist texts to China. By an imperial decree, I Ching was settled in Luoyang, where he devoted himself completely to the translation of Buddhist texts. In collaboration with an eminent monk from Khotan, Sikshanand, and also to learned Buddhist leaders Fuli and Fazang, I Ching completed the rendition of the Avatansak Sutra in the year 699. 
between 700 and 703, he translated over 20 Buddhist works in 115 fascicles. According to the records in Khai Yuan Shi Chiao Lu, he is credited with translating altogether 56 works in 230 fascicles. Among these scriptures and treatises, 159 fascicles come under the category of the Vinay texts, particularly of the Sarvastivad tradition. In addition, it is worth noting that according to the Sanjuan Shinti Shi Chiao Mulu, some extra works of 50 fascicles of the Sarvastivad Vinaya texts are also registered as I Ching's translations. Apart from the Vinaya texts, his translations of the Yogachar Sutras and of esoteric Dharanis are quite remarkable. Some of his well-known translations are the Mool Sarvastivad Vinaya, Golden Light Sutra in 603 of the Common Era, Diamond Sutra in 703 of the Common Era, Sutra of the Original Vows of the Medicine Buddha of Lapis Lazuli Radiance and the Seven Past Buddhas in 707 of the Common Era and the Avdans in 710 of the Common Era. Interestingly, while doing his translation work, I Ching also took time to train his students in the Vinaya. Despite political turmoil and palace intrigues, I Ching continued his translation work till his death on February 16, 713. He was buried with great honors in a monastery of the national capital Chang'an and was posthumously given the title of Director of Foreign Office, Honglu Ching. Lu Kan, by imperial request, composed a memorial inscription, a temple called Chin Kuan Ming, Gold Light, was built at his burial site in 758. Being a renowned pilgrim in his time, I Ching's outstanding achievements were reminisced now and then by later generations. For instance, in the year 758, to commemorate his translation of the Swaran Parabhas Uttam Sutra, that is the Sutra of Golden Light, the then Emperor Su Zong gave an order to build the Chin Kuan Ming Monastery in Chang'an. I Ching won an excellent reputation for being one of the very few Chinese pilgrims who successfully visited India and was devoted to spreading Buddhism by translating a variety of texts brought back from India. Added to this, he also expounded his knowledge of Sanskrit and his travel records in some exegetic works. He was the author of the earliest extant Sanskrit Chinese dictionary, Fan Yu Chian Si Yuan, that is a thousand Sanskrit words. Although the translations of his predecessor Xuanzang overshadow those of I Ching, a sample examination of both renderings of the Vinshatik indicates that I Ching was a better translator than Xuanzang. I Ching, a prolific translator of Buddhist canon, was during his lifetime honored with the title Sanzang Fashi, Master of the Three Pitak. His two most important writings are Nan Hai Chi Kui Ne Fa Suan, that is an account of the Dharma sent back from the Southern Seas, and Tha Thang Shi Yu Chiu Fa Kao Sang Chuan, that is record of the eminent monks who travelled to India in search of the Dharma during the Thang. The first text, that is Nan Hai Chi Kui Ne Fa Suan, illustrates the monastic regulations prevalent in India in the 8th century and is a comprehensive illustration of the Mool Saravasti Vad Vinaya, which covers almost every aspect of the monastic rules, examples which embrace regulations relating to Sangha's summer retreat, abstinence, monks' robes, ordination, ways of greeting guests and visitors, application of medicine, washing figures of the Buddha, tonsure, proper procedures of wearing kasaya robe, and so on. In order to popularize the proper disciplinary code and salvage the Vinaya from endless arguments, I Ching believed that the sacred writings of the Vinaya originally imported from India had to be made available to the Buddhist population. People had to be given an opportunity to acquire correct knowledge of the monastic rules. 
apart from promoting the accurate knowledge of the discipline, Eaching in his work also clarifies some misunderstandings spreading through the Buddhist community in China. For instance, Eaching points out that irreversible mistake caused by monks' self-immolation of body parts, whether fingers or genitals, is wrong. Also, a monk's suicide is conceived of as a guilty act only second to parachika, the unpardonable sin that results in expulsion from the order. And as prescribed in the Vinaya canon, looking on or instigating someone to commit suicide or self-destruction constitutes the felony of parachika. Eaching in his second text, that is, Tha Thang Shi Yu Chiu Fa Kao Sang Chuan, undertook a course of action to collect and compile the biographies of 56 monks whose contribution to the salvation of the individual and the promotion of universal enlightenment is considered to be indispensable and honorable. His main objective was not only to put down the biographies in praise of the self-sacrificing and adventurous spirit of these eminent monks, but also to establish the immortality of their wonderful accomplishments and brilliant scholarship. On the whole, talking about India, Eaching mentions that in the great majority of areas in India, there were followers of both Mahayana and Hinayana. However, he describes northern India and most of the islands of the South Seas, that is Sumatra, Java, etc., as being principal followers of Hinayana, he wrote, there exist in the West numerous subdivisions of the schools which have different origins, but there are only four principal schools of continuous tradition. These schools are the Mahasangika, Sthavir, Mool Sarvastivad and Samitya Nikayas. The written records of Yiching's travels contributed to the world's knowledge of the ancient kingdom of Shri Vijaya as well as providing information about the other human settlements lying on the route between China and India. Account of Buddhism sent from the South Seas and Buddhist monks' pilgrimage of Tang dynasty, records of Buddhist practices in South China and of the Chinese monks who travelled to India in the 7th century are important sources for historians of religion. In our program Travelogue, you were listening to some of the foreign travellers' account of India and their understanding of Indian culture and civilization. This program came to you from the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. You are with us on the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. You are with us on the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. We now bring you today's commentary, De-Escalation on India-China Borders. It is scripted by Professor Srikant Kundapalli, Center for Chinese Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and read by Kaushik Rai. The announcement for de-escalation after a two-hour-long discussions between the two special representatives on the India-China border issues has come as a big relief to the tense situation between India and China in Ladakh, which was brewing from May the 5th. The virtual talks between National Security Advisor Ajit Doval and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, the two special representatives tasked to resolve the territorial dispute and also address overall security issues between the two countries, has provided political guidance for the earliest complete disengagement between the troops of the two countries on the western sector of the border. The announcement expected full restoration of peace on the borders with phased and stepwise disengagement and de-escalation process. It further stated that both sides should respect and observe the line of actual control LAC and should not take any unilateral action to alter the status quo on the borders. Soon after the meeting, it was reported that the disengagement process has actually begun on the ground. It thus provided relief from the heightened tension that had been building up in the area for the past couple of months. This has led to mobilization of troops and military equipment by both countries. 
Such disengagement and de-escalation process, of course, needs to be monitored closely as India's position has been for restoration of status quo ante, that is, the situation prevailing on the ground in April 2020. Since May 5th, fisticuffs and stone throwing became the norm at the line of actual control as Chinese troops tried to move into the grey zones of the disputed territories and faced stiff resistance from the Indian troops. The restoration of status quo ante should result in Chinese troops vacating not only the Pangong So and finger points 4 to 8 but also the patrol points 14, 15 and 17 at Galwan, Gogra Hot Springs and the recent intrusions near Dolat Big Oldi, Depsang Plains and Galwan Heights. Of the 65 patrol points in the western sector of the border, starting from Karakoram region till southeast of Ladakh, some areas have become tense recently. The disengagement process was discussed between the two armed forces following the confidence-building measures CBM mechanisms evolved since the 1990s. These were discussed at the meetings on June 6th and 22nd between the local commanders, but the killing of 20 Indian Army personnel and about 43 Chinese PLA personnel on June the 15th night at Galwan Petrol Point 14 marked the relations. The meeting between the two special representatives came in the wake of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Ladakh on July 3rd, during which he had assured the armed forces of full backing. This sent a strong signal of resolve. Both countries had evolved elaborate CBM mechanisms such as the 1993 Peace and Tranquility Agreement, the 1996 CBMs in the military field, 2005 and 2013 Border Defense Cooperation Agreement that suggested no tailing of patrols by the other side. However, the Doklam incident in 2017 as well as the current tensions not only in the western sector but also at Nakula in Sikkim sector have raised concerns that the CBMs are not being adhered to by Beijing. While it is welcome to see the two Asian neighbors coming to terms on border stability issues, China's Foreign Ministry statement regarding the meeting suggested different priorities. It stated that while China will strive for peace and tranquility on the borders, it will firmly safeguard its territorial sovereignty. Moreover, it invoked the United Front tactics of focusing on developmental opportunities. Significantly, China also suggested that there is a need to guide public opinion in the right direction so as to avoid amplifying the differences between the two countries. China's reservations and conditions in addition to the past experience of stalled progress on the borders as well as its military logistics build-up suggest that India needs to remain vigilant in its border security and management in the coming weeks. That was today's commentary, De-Escalation on India-China Borders. It was scripted by Professor Shrikant Kundapalli, Center for Chinese Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and read by Koshik Rai. This commentary came to you from the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. This broadcast came to you from the digital channel of the General Overseas Service of All India Radio.